I'm beginning in verse 45 this morning. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people down with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. As I tell you, it will, re- it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for, I, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered others who were entering. And he went away from there. The scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Father, we ask, that you will take this infallible and inerrant word that you have given to us, make it clear to us, first of all, that we would understand what it is that it is saying, and then please apply it to our lives so that we know what it means to us, not just to those who heard it the first time. You have preserved it for a reason, and you have brought us here for a reason And we seek that now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. may be seated, and if you haven't already, turn in your Bible, please, to Luke 11. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, you'll you'll remember that Jesus has gone to lunch with a Pharisee, and it doesn't take it very long to turn contentious because Jesus doesn't wash up doesn't mean that his hands were dirty, but it means that he did not follow the prescribed tradition that the Pharisees had built up, the ceremonial process of cleansing before a meal. And so the host is appalled, this Pharisaical host, that Jesus would not follow this tradition, even though it had nothing to do with the law of God. It was simply the tradition that the Pharisees had built up. So Jesus takes the opportunity to bluntly warn against the issue of moralism, the danger of moralism, moralism, concerning ourselves only with what goes on outwardly and ignoring the issues of the heart where our sinfulness really resides. Moralism's kind of like the teenage girl, you know, that brought her boyfriend home, complete with all of his, you know, biker... uh, attitude and uh, appearance. Had the leather jackets and the chains and the, you know, tattoos down to here and the piercings and all the rest of it, an attitude that you could see across the room. And when he finally was gone, the parents let the daughter know they weren't real happy about this guy. They were questioning uh, whether he was really the kind of guy, a nice guy that that their daughter should be with. And the girl replied, well, if he isn't nice, why would he be doing 500 hours of community service? She was a little confused by the outward appearance. And so can we be. God sees straight to the inward defiance. It's just like window dressing, beloved, unless the heart is right. See, doesn't God want us to do us good things? Absolutely, but from a heart that is repentant and that wants to follow him. So Jesus, in the earlier part of this, passage that we did not read is already identified to the Pharisees four ways that moralism exhibits itself that we've looked at in past weeks. Moralists are exhibit, exhibit, (laughs) it's easy for you to say, exhibitionists of externals. They are concerned only about what's outside. To the moralist, it's all about what you do. To God, it's all about who you are. They are trivializers of truth. Moralists In the case of the Pharisees, were clinging to their tithe, 
which was kind of a little contribution that they thought they could make. Now, we're not so big on tithe as a little contribution, but we have other little things that we think we do that are going to ingratiate us to God. They were passionate about position. Moralists seek the approval of people over the approval of God. They were distributors of defilement. Moralists not only defile themselves inside, they lead others astray because they lead others to believe this is the way. Just be good outwardly. And so they lead others down that path. So Jesus has been on a roll. You know, he's, he's speaking to people that he's been now two and a half years trying to get to hear the message through his kindness, through his miracles, through his gentleness. And through answering directly some of the tough questions that they give to him, but it's just not penetrated their hard hearts. And so here he begins to use this term woe, begins to show up. It's a, it's a pronouncement of cursing and yet done with regret. The Son of God is always trying to bring people to repentance. He's not just condemning them, but he wants them to turn from their outward wicked ways of their heart to a heart that's really repentant. He's modeling what Paul later tells Timothy when Paul says to Timothy that he is to correct opponents. You can't just let them go on thinking it's okay, but correct opponents with the prayer that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. God has to do that. His works are striking hard. We see that because in verse 45 now, after he's pronounced these first four woes, suddenly somebody else stands up at lunch, one of the lawyers who's there. And the lawyer says to him in verse 45, Teacher, in saying these things, don't you realize you're insulting us also? Now what does that mean? Well, we have to understand who a lawyer is. This is not a courtroom lawyer as we would be used to. This is a lawyer who is expert at the tradition in the Jewish system that has built up around the law of God. It's not the law of God, but it's the traditions that have built up around it. And the lawyers were educated, kind of elite people who developed the system. The Pharisees were practitioners, but the lawyers were the ones that actually developed it. Now, many of the lawyers were also Pharisees, but the lawyers were the ones that were kind of behind it all. They were certainly modern in one sense. They knew where the loopholes were because they devised it. But this lawyer is not going to take this anymore. He stands up and says to Jesus basically that he's not only insulting the practitioners of the system, but with the comments that he's making, he's insulting the inventors of the system. And it's kind of a warning. What he's, what he's kind of saying, the implication of what he's saying is you're not just attacking laymen here, Mr. Rabbi, as people call you. You are attacking us, the religious elite who have invented this system. We're riding your line of fire. You're lobbing grenades right into our camp and you don't want to take us on. It takes Jesus about two seconds to reload and say, oh, you remind me. I do want to take you on. You're exactly who I want to take on. And pop, 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 three more jabs to the chin to the lawyers this time, addressed to the inventors themselves. So the first one he says to them, the fifth one overall, woe to you because you are loaders of legalism. You're loading people up with legalism. Verse 46, he said to them, woe to you lawyers also. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. The word load that's used there is a word that was used to speak of the cargo that was going into a ship in those days. I think you would get the same idea if you've ever sat on an airplane, I'm, I assume most of you have, somewhere on a window seat where you could watch, where you could watch the luggage being loaded into the hold on the airplane, right? Now imagine that you are standing there and they're loading all this luggage on top of you. That's the picture that Jesus is giving. He's saying to you, let me talk, let me talk to you lawyers because you guys are the ones who are loading all of this onto people. This tremendous burden. So what's the burden that they're loading on? Well, it's rituals. It's regulations. It's rules. 
People are being buried by those things. God's law? No, this has nothing to do with God's law other than God's law is kind of the basis upon which they make these things up. This is the regulations that they have put on them. It's men's attempts to clarify the law. And these manufactured traditions by this time numbered over 6,000. There's nobody who could keep track of all of them. So Jesus is saying, you are putting a smothering burden on people. But then it gets really interesting because he says to them, the second part of that verse, he reminds them that they're, while they're piling on others, you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. I don't know about you, but I read modern Congress right there. Don't you? <laughs> Making laws that they don't have to obey, but you and I do. That's what the Pharisees are doing. But you're saying, well, these lawyers, so they're making up laws, but they don't have to obey their own rules? How could, how could Jesus say that they don't touch the burdens that they impose on others? This is where the loopholes come in, beloved. This is where they know how to get around everything that they want to so that they can do whatever they want to by use of the loopholes that the average person doesn't know. There's no clue. And so he just has to go down the road and say, okay, I guess I got to do that. I got to do this. I got to do the other thing. We've talked about many of these before. Let me just give you one more example today. Leon Morris, one of the commentators on this, says this. He says, on the Sabbath day, they taught a man may not carry a burden. All this was, all this was a reaction to just the fact you have to keep the, the Sabbath day holy. They, they further defined that. It says, on the Sabbath day, they taught a man may not carry a burden in his right hand or on his left hand, in his bosom or on his shoulder. But he may carry it on the back of his hand or with his foot or with his mouth or with his elbow. You're getting the picture, right? Or in his ear or in his hair or in his wallet carried mouth downwards or between his wallet and his shirt or in the hem of his shirt or in his shoe or in his sandal. Loopholes. And there were thousands of them. So here's what Morris goes on to say. He says, these loopholes allowed the lawyers, quote, to do pretty much whatever they wished, end quote. But of course, the average person couldn't begin to keep up with these. They didn't know what these were. They had no idea. So the lawyer had worked it out so he could do whatever he wanted, go wherever he wanted, do whatever he wanted, whether it was the Sabbath day or not. And the average person was stuck. So Jesus is calling them out on this. How different this is, isn't it, from what Jesus says? Remember how Jesus says it in Matthew 11, 28 through 30? Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, loaded down. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What Jesus is saying, beloved, is simply this. The scribes' teaching created crushing burdens of guilt for these people. The gospel of Jesus Christ removes the burden of guilt you haven't discovered that, you really haven't discovered what the gospel is, you haven't discovered who Jesus is, you, haven't, you don't have a clue what this is all about. Jesus is not about loading us down with more burdens, he's about taking away the ones that we've had. Moralism crushes. The gospel frees and saves. Moralism demands. The gospel gives. Moralism burdens. The gospel forgives. I think one of the greatest illustrations of what this is all about was given to us you know, a few hundred years ago by John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress. Some of you read it. If you have, you may remember that Pilgrim finds himself, realizes one day he's got this growing burden of guilt on his back and he can't get rid of it. Nothing he can do, he can't take it off, he can't, everything he does just seems to make it grow. 
And so he meets a man named Evangelist, and Evangelist says to him, I can help you. I can tell you what to do. He says, go to the wicket gate where you'll, you'll see a light. And they go to the cross that's beyond the wicket gate, and your burden will be taken away. That's how you can have this guilt removed from you. And so Pilgrim decides that's what he needs to do. The guilt continues to grow. The burden continues to grow. He determines to leave. Friends mock him. Say, you, 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 think, you think just going to that place is going to get the burden off your back? Oh, are you kidding? His family mocks him, but he takes off anyway. The burden has grown so great that he wants to get rid of it. But on the way, he meets worldly wisdom. And worldly wisdom says, I got a better way. You, you don't need to be going to that cross. That's a long journey. He said, you just go up there to the city of moralism and you find Mr. Legality. He lives high on the hill up there. He'll fix you up. Sounds pretty good to Pilgrim. And so he takes off and he finds the city of morality and he begins to climb the hill of, toward the house of legality. But he notices the further he goes, the harder the burden gets until he can hardly walk. You know, in God's providence, he sends, he sends the evangelist again. And evangelist says, where are you going? He says, I'm, I'm going up here to legality. He says, that's not the way to go. He says, you have to go where I told you. Go to the wicked gate and to the cross that's beyond. That's where you can get rid of the burden. And so Pilgrim is once more pointed in the right direction. And soon he sees the light on the gate and he begins to go toward it. And he focuses on it. And he gets to the gate and as he passes through, he sees a fence on each side that's labeled salvation. At the end of the fence, fenced road, he sees a cross. And he begins to walk up the road to the cross. And as he gets there, he sees a sepulcher below the cross. And amazingly, as he gets near, the, the burden comes off his back. It disappears into the sepulcher and it's gone forever. This is the picture of the gospel, beloved. You have to bring the burden to the cross. It's the only place you can go. Here's what Pilgrim says. Now he's Christian. He says, with tear-filled eyes, Christian says, thus far did I come laden with my sin, nor could aught ease the grief that I was in till I came hither. What a place is this. Must here be the beginning of my bliss. Must here the burdens fall from off my back. Must hear the strings that bound it to me crack. Blessed cross, blessed sepulcher. Blessed rather be the man that was there put to shame for me. There's only one place that we can lose the guilt that moralism and legalism lays on us, beloved. Moralism will never solve your problem. You will never be good enough. You will know you're not being good enough. You will only increase the burden. But when you come to the cross, you say it can't be that easy. It wasn't that easy. It cost Jesus everything that he had. But when you come to the cross and ask forgiveness, the burden rolls away. It goes into the sepulcher. You die with him as we read this morning. As we, as we are memorizing in our verse, you have died with Christ and your life is hidden with him in God. That's what happens. But it only happens at the cross. Moralism loads us down. Jesus frees us up. Well, Jesus isn't done. He has another issue with the lawyers. He says that in verses 47 through 51, they are hiders of hypocrisy. They're hypocrites, just trying to hide it. And he calls them out. And boy, he does it in a, in a very challenging way. Verse 47, he says, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you, you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers. For they kill them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, and by the way, don't mix, get mixed up on that commentator spend forever on the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is the word of God. It's what God said. It says, for the wisdom of God said, or God in his wisdom said, 
I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it would all be required of this generation. You wouldn't have... I, I, you wouldn't really, would, really wouldn't have wanted to be an Old Testament prophet. I, I don't know that anybody lined up for that job. I, a couple of them, I can remember Jeremiah in particular, protested. <laughs> he didn't want to be a prophet. It was a tough job. You were just as likely to be killed or beaten as not. Just kind of went with the job. Why? Because it's tough to tell people that they have to give up their idols that they love. Times haven't changed. Those few in the Old Testament who stood for righteousness were often brutalized. Started right away off at the beginning with Abel, right? Abel brought that offering to God and was killed by his brother Cain because he brought a proper bloody offering. Cain just brought his best effort, the best effort from his own work. And he was refused. So he killed Abel. Abel's blood cried out against him. Zechariah, who is Zechariah? Most people take Zechariah to be, there's a prophet in 2 Chronicles, chapter 24. You could look it up when you get home if you want to, but 2 Chronicles 24, prophet named Zechariah who prophesied against King Josiah, one of the wicked kings in the north. He prophesied against him, and for his trouble, he was stoned in the courtyard of the temple and killed. And most think that's the Zechariah that's been being talked about here. Since Chronicles is the last book in the Hebrew Old Testament, not in, in our English version, but in the Hebrew Old Testament it is, Jesus would be saying something like this. He'd be saying, your fathers killed the prophets from Abel to Zechariah, from A to Z, from Genesis to Chronicles to the end. Inclusive. The only problem with that is that's not the Zechariah that he's talking about. The point is the same, but the Zechariah in 2 Chronicles, if you check him out, you'll find that he's the son of Jehoiada. Jesus' Zechariah is the son of Berechiah, according to Matthew 23, verse 35. And if you go back and look at the second book from the end in the Old Testament, which is called Zechariah, it's the record of the prophet of Zechariah, you'll find that he was, in fact, the son of Berechiah. Now, that Zechariah, we don't have any record that he was killed, but Jesus is telling us that he was. He was killed somewhere in the temple area as well. So the point is, the forefathers of the Pharisees were prophet killers. But as the prophets came to be revered posthumously, awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously, the Pharisees jumped on board. This generation said, we're going to build ornate tombs to these prophets. And why did they do that? Again, you can find this in Matthew 23. We won't look at it, but in Matthew 23, verse 30, Jesus says this, that, that, the, that as they built these ornate tombs, they were saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. We wouldn't have done that. And, and we'll prove it. We'll build these ornate tombs to them. They were trying to distance themselves from their ancestral guilt. Jesus isn't having any of it. He says, I know better than that. Look at verse 48, he says, so you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers. I see that by building these tombs, you're wanting to deny that, but that's not the case. You consent to the deeds of your fathers for they kill them and you build their tombs. They're saying our tombs are to honor the prophets. Jesus is countering and saying, oh no, your tombs show your consent. They kill them and you build tombs to make sure they stay dead. That's what he's saying. Now, what did he mean by that? In what sense did these tombs show their consent? Now, listen carefully, because this isn't that difficult, but I want to make sure you get it. They were referring to the physical tombs that they were building. And they meant them, in one sense, to honor Isaiah, Jeremiah, whoever it was that they were 
honoring. But Jesus was referring to the tombs of unbelief by which they were burying the message of the prophets just like their ancestors had buried the message of the prophets by actually killing them. The real tribute to the prophets was they were unbelievers just like their ancestors had been unbelievers. And how do we know that? Well, because their ancestors in every case were pointing toward the very one that these people were rejecting. Who was Isaiah talking about when he talked about the one who's going to bear our burdens and is going to, who's going to die for our sins? In Isaiah 53, he's talking about Jesus. Who is Jeremiah and all the rest of them of the Old Testament prophets pointing to? They're pointing toward Jesus. Who are the Pharisees rejecting? They are rejecting Jesus. Remember the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24? Maybe we should turn there. Last chapter in the book of Luke. This is the day of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. He catches up with two guys who are on their way home to Emmaus who do not yet know that Jesus is alive. So they don't recognize him. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if, I, if I were Jesus and I appeared on the road and these two guys said, we, we don't, are, are you kidding? You don't know what's been going on in Jerusalem? This Jesus who we put all our hopes in, they crucified him. Had I been Jesus, I'd have just, I'd sure jumped in front of him and said, ta-da, guys, look, I'm here, I'm alive. Doesn't that seem like the logical thing to do? But Jesus didn't do that. He, instead, he preached them a sermon. I, this is the one sermon in the whole Bible. That I, 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 would, I wish I could have been there. Listen to what he says in Luke 24, beginning verse 25. He said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, and all the prophets, that's the second section of the Jewish Old Testament. He interpreted them in all the scriptures. That's the third section of the Jewish Old Testament. So what he's saying is, and the Jewish people only had three sections in their Old Testament, what he's saying to them is in the, in the Torah, in the writings, and in the prophets, in other words, in the whole of the Old Testament, he showed them himself. He was on every page. And what he's saying is, you can't reject me without rejecting the message of the prophets because they all pointed forward to him and the Pharisees were hiding their hypocrisy behind the ornate physical tombs that they were building to the memory of the prophets at the same time they were rejecting the message just like their forefathers had. In rejecting Jesus, they were rejecting the whole message. That's why Jesus quotes God in verse 49. God says, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. And they did, did they not? They had already by this time killed John the Baptist. They were about to kill Jesus, the very Son of God. Shortly after that, they would kill Jesus. Stephen, then it would be James, and then on down the road. As God sent them prophets, they killed them just like their forefathers killed the prophets that God sent. They hated the message. The Pharisees and the lawyers unwittingly, you know, they, un they unwittingly operated on the principle the only good prophet is a dead prophet. They built monuments to dead ones, but their true legacy was to kill the message of God, just like their ancestors had. But this time, this time, Jesus says, enough. Beloved, we have to realize, God is very patient. Peter tells us he's not willing that any should perish, but even Jesus' patience and God's patience will run out one day. And for this generation, here's what Jesus says in verse 50. So the blood of all the prophets 
shed from the foundation of the world will be charged against this generation. Why? Because, because they were complicit. Because they were doing inwardly the same things that all their ancestors had done all through those years. And now the time of accounting has come. And so Jesus says in verse 51, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who, who, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will all be required of this generation. In other words, we're at the end, guys. This generation, and a generation in the Bible is usually considered to be about 40 years, this generation is going to see the judgment that is coming, and so it did. Between 66 and 70 AD, the Jews got into a rebellious war with Rome, essentially. It was a war they could not possibly win, but these word killers felt the wrath of God as they came up against the, the, the way to the Roman Empire. Between 66 and 70 AD, over a thousand cities in the land of Palestine were destroyed by the Romans. The Romans swept into the city of Jerusalem after they had laid siege to it, during, the, during which the conditions were horrendous, and we'll study more about it when we get to Luke 21, but they came into the city of Jerusalem, the temple was torn apart, thousands were massacred, other hundreds were sold into captivity, the Jews were not allowed to be in the city anymore, and they were experiencing the judgment that Jesus had promised was going to come on this generation because they continued the work that had gone on in previous generations. A horrendous physical reminder of the reality of the unspeakable spiritual fate which awaits all who pretend allegiance to God's word and to God's way and yet they are not submissive in their heart. They are disobedient and unrepentant and living self-sufficient lives. Moralism will not do, beloved. Not in the end. Is there application? I suspect. How many of us today have the word of God sitting in our shelves? An ornate decoration that we pay tribute to while ignoring the message. Never spend any time in it find it difficult so we don't pursue it. Do you know God made, you know, the basic message of the gospel of, of the Bible isn't difficult, but I grant you the Bible is not easy to understand. Do you know God made it that way on purpose because he wanted us to dig, he wanted us to want it. He wanted to know who's real and who's not. This kind of sorts us out, doesn't it? We're like the guy who came out of the mountains of Western Carolina one day. A friend, you know, this is in the old days. A friend saw him and he said, Elias, where are you going? He said, I'm going to New Orleans. He said, New Orleans? What are you going to New Orleans for? He said, oh man, you haven't heard? It's great down there. He said, there's plenty to drink. They're gambling down there. They got, you know, great shows down there. They got all the women you could want. I'm, I'm going to New Orleans. He said, well, Elias, how can I be taking your Bible with you? He said, well, if it's, as, if it's as good as they stay, I, I may stay over until Sunday. So I got to be prepared, right? Got to have my Bible. That's the way we are, beloved, if we're not careful. The Bible is just an ornate, the ornament, the kind of the final ornament, you know? We, we, imagine seeing a physical coffin and we, and we dress the corpse up and then we put a Bible in in the hands, right? But that's what, we, that's what we do when we pay lip service to it, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, we don't allow the Holy Spirit to change our lives through the power of the Word. We're just dressing up the corpse. It's the, it's the, final, it's the final element of a well-dressed corpse. Put the Bible in. Do you love the Bible? Do you live by the Bible? Do you take the message of God as including you, or are you just kidding everybody, including yourself? Final thing Jesus tells these guys is that they are dealers in deception. Dealers in deception. Verses 52 through 54. Perhaps this is the worst of all. They, they at least 
they at least kind of worked it, trying to get the message, but then they totally messed it up. Totally messed it up. They were self-deceived and they condemned others. Verse 52, woe to you lawyers. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. Imagine being told that. You've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourself and you hindered those who were entering. How had they taken away the key of knowledge? By misrepresenting the word. By misrepresenting the word. You take away the key of knowledge when you misrepresent the word. This is why Jesus, uh, why God says to teachers in James 3, they're going to be worthy of double condemnation. Why? Because they're not just taking themselves down the road to disaster, they're taking others with them. You've taken the key of knowledge. You've misrepresented the word. They were teaching moralism instead of teaching repentance. How did that happen? It happened for the same reason it happens to us. We pick and choose the parts we like and we throw the rest of them away. They should have known this. This is why God gave them passages like a, a couple of them I'm going to read for you now. Don't turn to these, but just listen to this. Here's what God says to them in Isaiah 1, verse 13. He said, bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. Now, you should be saying, wait a minute. Who told them to do these feasts in the first place? Who told them to bring these offerings in the first place? Was this not God? Was this not his message to them? Isn't this what the part of the Bible we sometimes skip over is all about in Leviticus and, and in Numbers and in Deuteronomy? Isn't this where these feasts come from? Didn't God say this? Yes. So how can he say he hates them? It's because of what he says at the end of verse 13, I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. He didn't have their hearts. He's had their outward appearance wasn't good enough. It was moralism. And all the way through, even when he was giving the law, he constantly pointed to the fact that it needed to be their heart. It says in Malachi 1.10, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, I just close the church down, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. The problem, unrepentant hearts. See, where did God tell him in the Old Testament to have repentant hearts? Well, a whole bunch of places. But how about just Psalm 51, verse 16 to start with? This should have been a clue to everybody that the, that the Pharisees were misleading Psalm 51, 16, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give, this is David speaking to God. He says, for you would not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. Now listen to this, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God hates outward appearance without a heart behind it, beloved. You just as well <laughs> close up shop and go home. You're just loading on the guilt. God wants your heart. And the Pharisees were hiding this knowledge. They kept telling the people you must keep the law to be saved, but the law was never there to save people. That's why the law was given after their deliverance from Egypt. Pay attention to the order that things happen in the Bible. First came deliverance by grace through faith. Then came the law. Then came the law to tell them how to live now that they could express their heart's love for God. Now came the law to tell new generations of Israelites, this is why you need a Savior. The law came after the deliverance. The law was given to teach you can't make it on your own. You need a Savior. In rejecting Jesus, listen to this. In rejecting Jesus, they were rejecting the only way to ever 
possibly keep the demands of the law. The demands of the law don't go away, but they get met in the person of Christ. Do you see that? And if you haven't accepted him as your way of keeping the law, you're as lost as you could be in all the moralism and all the goodness and all the rest of it that you could ever pile one on top of the other will not pay. The best that moralism can do is make the outside look a little better. It can't bring new life. Rich ritual without repentance is repulsive to God. Repulsive. That's why he says, I don't want your offerings. Close the doors. The gospel strips us bare of pretense and it forgives the old and it creates new. Simple, simple story, let me close with, but here's two artists, you know, they're out scrounging the countryside trying to find something to paint. They come to an old barn, lots of objects of interest in there, and one of them finds an old wheelbarrow, you know, that's got some ground in it, and there's actually some siege sprouting up, and, and the other one looks at that wheelbarrow and says, wow, this is, this is exciting, that'd, be, that'd make a great still life. You probably have to be an artist to get excited about that kind of thing, but they were excited about that. So the farmer came in the barn about that time and said, what are you guys doing? They said, well, we're just looking for things that we might be able to paint. We found this old wheelbarrow. And one of them said, would you mind, would you mind if we painted this wheelbarrow? The farmer looked at him like they were crazy. And he said, yeah, you can paint it, but it's not going to help. It won't make it into a wheelbarrow again. That's what moralism is, beloved. It's an attempt to paint the wheelbarrow and get new life, and you can't. There's only one way to get new life, through Jesus Christ. The best moralism can ever offer is to make the best-dressed corpse in town. If that's what you're aiming for, that's the way to do it. But if you're aiming for salvation, it has to be through Jesus. Moralism loads it on. Repentance takes it all away. Repent. Get it taken away. Father, I personally don't know how to make this any more clear. I don't think your word could make it any more clear. But Lord, I am well aware I can't change a heart. I can't remove the blindness that Satan puts on the eyes of unbelievers, according to your word. I can't stop people from continuing to think it's my baptism certificate, it's my confirmation certificate, it's my good works, it's my giving to the whatever. That's what's going to save me. I can't stop that, but you can. And I'm praying this morning, Father, those who are sitting here thinking that it's their good works that are going to get them in, would you please disabuse them right now? Help them to see that moralism is just adding on to the guilt because it's saying I could make it without Jesus. His death didn't have to happen. It was a huge mistake. Sorry that you did that, God. Oh, Lord, please break through the rebellion and create new hearts. Do it for the glory of your name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and <coughs> sing together and please sing it from your heart. Change my heart, oh God. Let's sing together. <coughs>